So I want to talk about what I consider to be a predicament in energy. In a particular, so here's um, oil production from one country, but I could show you 45 others that have an almost identical profile. And so this is looking at the barrels per day that the United States produced from 1920 on through um, to about current. And we see that the United States hit a peak of production right around 1970. And no matter what the United States has done, 3D seismic technology, different end of oil recovery methodologies, slant bottle brush drilling, ultra deep rigs, uh, you name it, it hasn't changed the basic slope of the story, which is we hit a peak, we went past peak, and the United States will never again achieve that same peak of production. No country that's gone past peak yet has managed to reachieve its peak of production. Once you go past the peak, it's over. And that's simply, we can understand it in a single oil field. Once you tap a single oil field and it goes past its peak of production, it's, there's just nothing there to get out of the ground. And if we aggregate that across hundreds of oil fields across an entire continent, you get the same story, just it looks like this. So for the United States, of course, um, after past peak, we still can, uh, consume a lot more than we produce. And how do we solve that? Well, we import a lot. This is the import wedge for the United States, importing about two-thirds of its liquid petroleum needs. Now, here's the thing. Um, people in the oil business are very picky about this. They, they say that before you can pump oil, you have to find it. And um, it, it's, a, it's a law or something that they live by. So what we really care about is when, is when did oil discoveries peak? Because in the United States, oil discoveries peaked in 1930 and production peaked in 1970, a 40-year gap. Well, it turns out, here's a nice chart. This is all the chart you ever need to understand where we are in the oil story. This is looking at world or global discoveries of oil by decade. And we see that the 1960s were the peak decade of discoveries, 1964 being the peak year. But it's, re it's irrelevant. The by decade is, is, is good. Green is history. Red is what we're projecting. We're hoping we're going to find. And you read about things all the time. Oh, in Brazil, they found 30 giga barrels in the Tupi salt fields. It's an extraordinary find, largest in a decade. And it's true. But 30 giga barrels on this chart is about the size of that first green bar all the way to your left. That's the largest find in the past decade. Well, if you have to find it before you pump it, and there's about a 40-year gap between when you have your discovery peak and you have your production peak, this chart should tell us everything about where we might be in the oil story. It's a little over 40 years ago since we had our world discovery peak. And uh, we are already seeing some troubling signs in oil um, production figures. This is a chart that came out from the International Energy Agency in 2008. It should have been on the cover of every magazine, every newspaper, and we should still be talking about it. And it went by with barely a blip. Prior to developing this chart, which shows where we are on the oil story, the IEA had always put out its projections of how much oil we were going to get out of the ground by going to economists and asking, how much is the economy going to grow? And the economist would say 5% a year, and the IEA would go back and plug that in and say, well, I guess we're going to make this much oil then. In 2008, they said, hey, wait a minute. What if we actually add up all the oil fields that we know about and, and actually put them in a database and ask a different question, which is how much can they produce based on known depletion parameters? And they came up with this chart. And this one was a doozy. Now, remember, this came out in 2008. The first thing we noted was that they admitted that big blue blob on the bottom, that big blue wedge on the bottom, that is oil from currently producing fields, a euphemism for cheap and easy. They admitted that we were past peak for cheap and easy oil. That means expensive oil is in the, uh, inexpensive oil is in the rear view mirror. This was a startling admission. And then the next blue wedge up is crude oil from fields yet to be developed. We know they're there. We're going we're gonna to have to um, drill a lot of things. But you know, we basically know that's there. Look at that red wedge. That next red wedge is crude oil from fields yet to be found. It's called the wedge of hope. We hope we find that stuff, right? And what if we don't? So the first thing that was really important about this chart was they admitted that we are past peak cheap and easy oil. That right there, full stop, that's everything. Uh, anybody who cares about the future or who has long range plan needs to understand right away. It, it's a critical piece of information. And the second thing they did, which was really quiet, 2030, their projections had always been for 130 million barrels per day of pr annual production. They walked that all the way back to 105 million barrels. That was in 2008. In 2009, they walked it back a little further, 2010 a little further. And this year, they just came out with their peak. Um, they think we're going to get to 96 million barrels per day by 2030. They just keep walking it down in terms of what we're going to get. 
What we can t guarantee you is the amount of oil that is now projected to come out of the ground over the next 20 years is a fraction of what we had been planning on and a fraction of what is needed to sustain the type of global growth that we've had over the prior four decades. Full stop, that is an important admission and we should still be debating it endlessly. And in my country, at the national level, we're still not discussing it at all. So there's a peak here and there's also a cap on the total amount of production that we might have that actually sits about where that bar is right now. And it's a really rather startling admission to be making. So the quantity of oil is, a, is, a, is something we should care about. Quantity, how much? How many millions of barrels per day? Is it 96, 103, whatever? But it's not the most important part of this story. And the part you haven't heard about yet, even if you've heard about peak oil, is this next part. Because you might have, but it's pretty rare people have heard about this. Here's the thing I worry about. We had an oil shock in the early 1970s. Jimmy Carter, president of my country at the time, put on a sweater and the, said we have a, a problem and actually delivered a, a really prescient speech which everybody could read and say, wow, that he, he, spot on. Uh, we decided in my country to, to go with mourning in America, a different concept, and bought SUVs instead. The, the thing that I worry about is that we had oil shock one in the 70s and then oil shock two came in 2008. And my worry is that people will look at that and say, well, there was 35 years between oil shocks, maybe it will be 35 between the next two oil shocks. And that would be true if and only if we weren't somewhere in our stadium with water pretty far up the stairs already. It is my prediction that we will be seeing the next oil shock maybe three, maybe four years after the last one. We'll be seeing it somewhere between now and maybe 2013. And that is the nature of speeding up of the collapsing and compression of time that we would expect to see. So that's one prediction I have. But here's the important part. It turns out that what we care about is not how much money does oil cost because you know, we print money out of thin air. So what does it matter if it's a dollar or 10 million dollars? That's irrelevant. What we care about is if we have to spend one barrel of oil to get a barrel of oil, we no longer have what we need to run our society on. So what we care about is the energy return. It takes energy to find energy. There's steel involved and diesel and all kinds of things we have to do to go and find that energy. So this is a hypothetical chart that asks the question, hey, how much energy are we getting back from the energy that we have to put in as we explore. So energy out by energy in. The green on the bottom is the energy that we get back. The energy, the red is the energy that we have to use to get energy. The reason we care is because the green stuff is what we run our society on. It's how everybody got, oops, excuse me. It's how everybody got into this room. It's how we eat every day. When we go home tonight and, and, and we eat dinner, most of that food got there with a huge energy subsidy from oil in particular. So it's surplus energy we care about. And here's an interesting story. So when we first started, um, oh, and it crosses at one, because again, when you're spending one barrel to get one barrel, you have a 0% return off of that. That means you're keeping your engineers busy, but you're not delivering anything back to society that we can use. And the story is interesting, because when we first started looking for oil, uh, we were getting 100 to 1 or greater returns. You know, the Gowar field in Saudi Arabia, it's only 1,100 feet down, and it's on land, and it's under pressure, and it's light, sweet, crude. It's gorgeous, right? Um, maybe, maybe two or 300 to one returns for the Goar field. And then as we started going along in the 70s, we were chasing stuff, the smaller field, some of it's offshore, we're getting still 25 to one returns. Look how much green is still under that. Huge amount of green. And then as we go forward, 1990s, maybe we're getting 18 to one to 10 to one returns from our oil finds, still a huge amount of green under that. But when we consider what we're doing with tar sands today, or what we might be considering doing with tar shales, or the oil shales of the West, or what we're even doing with deep water drilling, we're actually getting oil returns closer to three to one. Note that when we go from 100 to one to three to one, it's not a nice straight line like the ones we intuitively understand. This is a non-linear curve. It means that there's a cliff that we can face, where once we get off about maybe five to one or less, we suddenly fall off very rapidly down this energy cliff. And here's, the, here's why we care about that. If we get to live on that big green area there, what happens when we're only living on oil finds that come in at three to one? Well, this is the world we live in. There's just a whole lot less green that we get to operate society in. That means there's less energy for us to do with what we please to do with it. That means that we will have less complex societies. It means our economy will no longer grow. In fact, it will have to shrink. It means that all of our parameters and paradigms around how we grow debt endlessly forever will have to change. And not because of any law or failure of imagination or because we're not clever or we have a desire to have things end badly. It's simply a matter of physics and science at this point. And the worry is if we try and live in a world of corn-based ethanol like my country's trying to do, that's the world we're going to inhabit. Corn-based ethanol has a 1.5 to 1 return. 
that's what the world would look like. There is almost no green there for us to live within. It's a very tiny micro band, and it's an incredible story. And so the story is this. When you read about those Tupi salt fields in, off Brazil, which are 26,000 feet down, or you read about the tar sands, which they scoop out of the ground with giant D9 cats and put into giant machines to bake the, the tar off of the sand, or when you hear about the Orinoco belts in Venezuela, or all of these things, just think about how much energy we're getting back. All of those are low quality energy finds compared to what we used to um, find and what we're used to living on. So it means quality is an issue. It means that when we're thinking about this thing that must grow, this economy, and we've now attached it to an energy system that we reasonably suspect maybe can't grow, when you think about that energy side, I want you to think about both pieces, both the quantity and the quality, two cues very important in the story. And the quality is still not really talked about, even in, in the most, uh, uh, you know, the best newspapers out there. They're still not talking about it. 